at an, threat, at an alarming pace, and we will be speaking about that today. So I will share my screen now, and I hope that this will be working. So. Here we go. In full screen now. So you can see that, I hope. So my name is Udo Gartenlöhner. I'm the executive director of Global Nature Fund. And as I have been mentioning, this is an event of three organizations together. We um, are very grateful that the German NGO Forum on Environment and Development has been organized that it's on the occasion of the World Wetlands Day of the Ramsar Commission. I mentioned that the oldest convention uh, actually uh, from 1971, 50 years ago. Global Nature Fund is a charity, a small charity. We're a nonprofit foundation based in Germany on environment and nature. We have one office. This is where I am sitting at Lake Constance with three riparian countries, apart from Germany, Austria and Switzerland are also bordering this lake with almost 600 square kilometers surface. What you can see here now is on that photo, one of the smaller tributaries to the lake. There are more than 300 tributaries and only one outlet, that is the River Rhine. In addition to that office here in the very south of the country, we have two more in Bonn and in Berlin. And actually what we are doing is we have four pillars in terms of our projects, a focus on water and lakes, very historically, this is in our DNA, so to speak, in our genes, um, nature conservation, also species protection, a very specific focus on business and biodiversity and development cooperation based primarily on the very broad and diverse network, the Living Lakes Network that we launched as GNF in 1998. So more than 20 years ago with currently 112 member lakes represented by more than 140 organizations, primarily NGOs, but not exclusively. Why focus on lakes and wetlands? I mentioned it in the very beginning. Unfortunately, we're losing these valuable ecosystems at an alarming pace. As you can see here, over 60% of ecosystems on the planet are under risk, but water ecosystems are even more threatened. So three quarters of all wetlands are under jeopardy. In Germany, in other countries in Europe, but also globally. And unfortunately, those valuable ecosystems are disappearing much faster than any other ecosystem on the planet, three times faster than forests. This is really frightening. And during the last 50 years, we have lost a third of those valuable ecosystems. Despite they hold a very large biodiversity, and this is why we have long ago started this threatened lake of the year declaration. For the very first time, we have declared a lake or a wetland region for the second time, the Pantanal, because of the devastating fires that you have heard of in that region. And um, many of them are of anthropogene origin. That means human beings have started those fires for land reclamation and many other reasons. So we will hear more about that later from Bettina. Thank you very much for your attention so far. With that, we will continue with a presentation from our Spanish colleague from uh, Antonio Guillem, a project manager with the Fundación Global Nature in Spain. Uh, Antonio himself, he is based in Valencia and the Albufera, a wetland that is very important uh, and very close to Valencia, uh, is one of the regions where he spent a lot of time and efforts working on. And we will hear from him uh, what uh, the status quo of this wetland is now, because the Albufera has been the threatened lake of the year last year in 2020. So with that, I will hand over 
to Antonio. Antonio, your floor. Thank you. Thank you, Udo, for the presentation. I'm going to share the screen. Okay, so first of all, I want to say thanks to, to be here for all the organization team. And let's see, I will try to, to tell you a little bit about the, the Albufera, which is the, the situation and some, some things around the lane. So first of all, for, for, for introduce the, myself and the, the Fundación, I want to say the Fundación Global Nature is a Spanish national NGO. We are 34 staff in five different headquarters. At this moment, working at home, majority mm -hmm. part of us. And we live thanks to national and European funds. We have three different working lines, conservation of habitat and species, and agro food and corporate sustainability. Uh, in our working line of conservation of habitat and species, we can find wetlands as our mine habitat where we have been working for 30 years. Here, <coughs> sorry. Here you, can, you can see Castilla y León, where La Nava and Boada are. Here you can see Castilla-La Mancha. This is in, in, in this small in this small point. Uh, we have more than 25 uh, wetlands, which is called La Mancha Húmeda, uh, La Man wet La Mancha. And well, here we can see the Valencia region where the albufera is. We albufera is the the threatened wetland that I'm going to tell you about. And you can see a nice landscape, but with a very, very green water. <clears throat> For introduce you La Albufera, La Albufera originally was an, an open sea bay. And with the sediments of the Hookah and Rubia and Anturia River, this 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 barrier close and uh, the, the, this 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 barrier close and the the water change so the lake suffer a transformation from seawater to fresh water and also during the 19 and the beginning of uh, 20 centuries human uh, drained the the lake to turn it into rice paddies. So the humans transformate the, the ecosystem in, in a natural, natural wetland to an artificial system. So and here you can see that at the beginning, we had more than 30,000 hectares of, of sea bay, and now we only have 3,000 hectares. So at this moment we have a very a, a heavy a, a very wetland a, a wetland uh, very modified by humans. Despite this modification, uh, La Albufera is a, a very huge protected area. It's natural park, it's ranch and site. Uh, we are under Natura 2000 network, also is SPA. So, and, and also we are under the, the European regulation with the Water Framework Directive and Habitats Ambit Directive. So I want to say that it's not, uh, it, it, we, we have a, a very great environmental values here in, in our lake. So we have, uh, rice paddies that is a very dynamic ecosystem. We have different habitats in, in the same place depending the the season. And also we have other landscapes like springs, dunes, and we have a lot of biodiversity. But of course, we have problems. 
in the 17th, we had a, the lake had a, a, a crisis where a lake with clear waters and underground vegetation and with a lot of biodiversity transformed to uh, a, a lake with little uh, biodiversity with green waters. <clears throat> Uh, well, one of one of these problems is the the lack of the lack of water. So here in this graph, uh, you can see the, the evolution of the inflows of the water. Uh, I don't have the graph for the the last the last few years, but it it hasn't changed it much. It, I think it's worse. So here you can see the in in this blue blue color. This is the inflows of natural waters. This is inflows of a uh, hookah river. This, uh, this, this blue color also is the inflows of a uh, wastewater treatment plant of the municipalities. This is the inflow of uh, the other river, the Turia River. And this is the inflow of the biggest uh, wastewater treatment plant in Valencia. It's called Pinedo. And this is the this this yellow line is the ecological flow for the lake. So we can see how the inflow of quality water decreases and treated water is increasing in the in the in this in this time. So this, this, this change of quality water produced the, the decrease of the biodiversity of the biodiversity and also the, the, well, the, the life, the, all the life in the lake. So you can see the, the, the green soap that there is the, actually the, the lake. So, we have little water and of poor quality. And this is the, the also, this is also a, a, the, the huge problem I think we have is that, as you know, La Albufera is a, a lake surrounded of paddies. And <clears throat> this is, this, this, all these paddies is makes the management difficult because there are uh, many owners and who, who makes who, who manage this field uh, independently so there is not a strict a strict control over fertilizer and pesticides and all the field need to grow the rice need to grow here in this in this in this photo, you can see the the rice straw. Because uh, in in September October when the the harvest is coincides with the rainy season, and often the the rice straw uh, remains in the in the file without being collected, and this straw roots into the flooding paddy. So this root caused the anoxia and therefore the died of all kind of life inside the, the, the lake. So Antonio, here you get... Antonio, sorry for the interruption. If you want to show the video, you have to come to an end pretty close. Okay, it's the last one. It's the last one. You... Yeah. <laughs> so oh, you can see here the 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 the, the dive of the of the feces produces for for the anoxia and also this is the well it's the same time the this is the main problem i i wanted to say so the time of the harvest with the rainy season and what are the authorities doing i don't know but what is the what what Fundación Global Nature did? So we we fight in the social network. We write press release. We participate in seminars. We do restoration project, and we do a lot of uh, environmental education. And also, Udo, please. 
I want to introduce our video in which we, 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 we say our history during the last 30 years. And that's my contribution for all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for that presentation. Muchas gracias. Uh, a wetland that is um, influenced by the big city as well as rice production, as you said. Uh, if there are any immediate questions, uh, we might respond to them immediately. If not, you can hold them for later. We will have a discussion at the end and then you might want to address Antonio directly. Uh, Antonio want to share a video with us. That's only two minutes and a couple of seconds. So I will start that, or at least I will try from my computer. I hope that it will work together with the sound. Okay, you will see that video in a few seconds. Hopefully. Thank you very much, Antonio, for that excellent video with the Kingfisher at the end. Yeah. I think there are few organizations, few environmental organizations with that, such a profound uh, knowledge on, I have to stop that now, I'm sorry. Uh, on agriculture and how to balance agriculture and nature conservation like the Fundacion in Spain. And we have learned a lot from you also in terms of constructed wetlands very happy for this fruitful partnership. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. We have seen uh, an otter in this little video and an otter might link this presentation to the next one from Bettina because there are giant otters in the Pantanal that are massively threatened uh, by the fires at the time being and the Pantanal is the threatened lake of the year 2021 and Bettina will tell us more about it. Bettina, your floor. 
Thank you very much, Udo. I try to share my screen. So, yeah, um, I want to um, introduce the Pantanal, which is uh, Threatened Lake of the Year 2021. Um, yeah, lakes and wetlands belong to the most valuable ecosystems in the world. They provide water, food and livelihood for millions of people and habitat for an impressive biodiversity. They store more carbon than many other ecosystems. But on the other hand, they are among the most threatened habitats worldwide. So um, therefore, we started in 2004 to announce every year on the World Wetlands Day one lake that is particularly endangered. And um, this year, it is again the Pantanal. And as you can see in the list, um, the Pantanal had been threatened lake of the year already in 2007. But as you might have also seen in the news, the um, alarming pictures um, last year of the burning areas, the Global Nature Fund and the Living Lakes Network to decided to announce or to nominate the Pantanal once again as threatened lake of the year in 2021. So the Pantanal is the world's largest inland wetland with 230,000 square kilometers. And it's a huge floodplain that is um, mostly in uh, Brazil, 90% of it are in Brazil and the rest is in Bolivia and Paraguay. The Pantanal gives home to more than 1,700 plant species. It's a biodiversity hotspot. It gives home to more than 120 mammal species, including uh, um, a, a great, um, a large jaguar population and to more than 650 bird species, including the very rare hyacinth macaw. Our Living Lakes partner organization since the year 2000 is the NGO Fundação Ecotopica. And we contacted them last year to learn about their activities. And besides fighting against the fires, they drove more than 30,000 kilometers to provide water and more than 20 tons of food for the suffering animals in the burned areas. And they installed more than 40 food islands. And this help is gratefully accepted of the animals. And currently they are also starting a monitoring um, activity to see how the large uh, mammals in the region are um, getting along in the areas after the fires. So, and in order to join forces, we um, also got in contact with further environmental organizations in the region. And we learned that their current and long-term activities um, include on the one hand, first aid for the suffering and burned animals. They, um, since many years, train local farmers and people in the communities, volunteers in firefighting. So um, the farmers use the, um, the fires to clean their fields, and this will help them to keep these fires under control. So this is a normal tradition in the area. And they also try to create alternative income sources for the local families, like honey production or ecotourism. So, and in the Pantanal, there is a man-made vicious circle. So the cattle farming, sugarcane and soy cultivation increased due to a huge demand in the Northern, in North America and in Europe. And the loss of forests for um, 
cultivated areas in the Pantanal and also in the Amazon lead to a regional increase in temperature and shorter rainy seasons. So, and if there is less water in the area, this leads to less evaporation um, to build a dense cloud cover. This would soften the radars, uh, this, um, the solar radiation and would protect the land from drying out. And this leads to more fires. So the situation in the Pantanal uh, in the last year was that in the, so there is a, a dry season and a wet season, uh, changing a normal change every six months approximately. And in the dry season from October 2019 to March 2020, that was 40% less rainfall. So, and this is said is one of the worst dry seasons in almost the past 50 years. Due to, or according to NASA satellite data, there were around 11,000 fires detected in the area until October 2020. And it is estimated that until that time, almost one quarter of the Pantanal area may have burned and our contacts reported that it's almost one, one third of the area. So we nominated the Pantanal a threatened lake of the year this year again to draw attention to the tireless commitment of the local NGOs. We want to raise awareness among the population in Brazil, but also in Europe and on international basis to make people rethink their consumption behavior and to understand the consequences of their consumption. And of course, we want to create awareness among the decision makers in Brazil and also on international level and to um, yeah, to ask them to implement the existing environmental laws and to consistently punish violations. So, but we also have positive examples that we announce every year. So in the Living Lakes Network Germany, we announce the Living Lake of the year. This is this year, the lakes of Holstein, Switzerland in Northern Germany. And you might wonder why uh, we have two years. Um, so it's because of the Corona, um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to cancel all our festivities and activities. And so we decided to postpone uh, this to this year. So this is an award in the framework of the network Living Lakes Germany, one of the subnetworks of the Living Lakes Network. It is yearly announced on the World Water Day on 22nd of March. And with that, we want to highlight very positive examples of how collaboration of NGOs, authorities and municipalities can work. And in this case, we have also a very good best practice example, the Lake Monitoring Program as a citizen science initiative. And you can find further information on um, the lakes of Holstein, Switzerland on our website. So thank you very much for your attention. And let me know if you have questions. Thank you very much, Bettina. Vielen Dank. Um, usually we would hear applause now. So you can just imagine that there is applause. Thank you very much for that uh, very comprehensive and interesting insight into particularly the Pantanal, uh, almost the size of Germany. And if a third of that region is burning, you can imagine what that means and the negative effects to the pop population of the endangered species, such as Jaguar. I saw a hand, is there any immediate question? So Bettina is happy to take it. No? Okay, as I said, we will have a little bit of time at the end. Uh, and what I want to recap very briefly is what Bettina said at the end. There are three, and there is quite some interest uh, of media concerning this designation of the Pantanal as the threatened lake of the year. I had two radio interviews today 
in the morning. And the question has been, so what can we do? And Bettina elaborated on that. I think there are three aspects. So firstly, we can support the organizations in Brazil, the firefighters, but also the environmental organizations. And we can support them secondly, in putting pressure on the government. And we tried to put some pressure. We are small, but we're not alone to put some pressure on uh, Bolsonaro, the president uh, of Brazil that is tolerating what is going on there. There are even some um, land reclamation laws uh, that uh, make this land reclamation that is illegal, kind of legal and inverted commas. And thirdly, we can see our responsibility in terms of supply chains of forest and agricultural products that often fuel in inverted commas, uh, this uh, massive problem in the Pantanal um, because we import, for instance, uh, soya and, and some other products at very low prices. So we will continue with that in collaboration with our Brazilian and other Latin American partner organizations and colleagues. From Lake Constance to Spain, from Spain to Latin America, and now back to Europe, to Lake Balaton, a lake that is more or less the same size, slightly bigger than the lake where we live in comparison to Lake Constance. So we have uh, Eva Varga from the Lake Balaton Development Coordination Agency working as a project manager. And Eva has been involved and I think very responsible for organizing a um, beautiful event called uh, the Lake Marathon last year. And I think this was a brilliant idea to show, despite the COVID-19 restrictions we have, that there is a lot of dynamic and a lot of exchange. And we're happy to hear more about that. Eva, it, Eva it's your floor. Thank you. Thank you, Udo. First of all, um, I would like to thank you for the invitation to attend uh, this meeting today. And um, I am pleased to talk about a little bit about the Global Lake Marathon, about the 24 hour long event, online event we organized in November last year. But um, now I try to share my screen. Hopefully you will see it. Working, yes. Okay. Um, one moment because it opens a different slide. Hopefully now it works. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Eva Varga and I work for the Lake Button Development Coordination Agency. Uh, many of you know, already knows me, uh, while others see the, my name from the emails I uh, sent you on a constant basis to you to inform you about our activities. Um, as I uh, mentioned, you, um, uh, we organized this event in order to, um, uh, to uh, get in contact with you and talk a little bit about the lakes and about the importance of lakes. But before I go into details, um, I would like to talk about a little bit about the background of the um, idea of the marathon. Uh, the question that we often get is um, how we got the idea to organize a 24 hour long event. As uh, many of you know, um, the sustainable management and the integrated management of lakes and lake areas is a priority task for uh, the Lake Balaton Development Coordination Agency. Um, we are working on calling the attention of, um, of the general public. And uh, we are also working on calling the attention of decision makers, both at national and regional level, but also, um, also um, on international level. Here you can see a list of uh, events that we organized in the last couple of years. We, um, we tried to organize various events on local and regional level, but we also try to uh, reach uh, decision makers at international level as well, uh, also involving your help as well. 
Um, you can see that, uh, for example, we organized an um, external conference for the Commission for Environment, Climate Change and Energy of the Commission of the Regions. We um, also organized a conference um, in the framework of the Science Meets Regions, co-financed by the Joint Research Center. And we also organized an important event, a side event for the Budapest Water Summit, where we also tried to call the attention for the importance of integrated uh, lake management and also to call the attention to find a solution for uh, financing these kind of integrated programs. Last year, we uh, aimed to continue uh, our work and we uh, aimed to organize a similar event. But due to the pandemic, unfortunately, we couldn't organize personal meetings. So we um, decided, oh, why it goes back. So, sorry. So um, we decided to organize uh, online uh, consult online meetings. These meetings have, of course, advantages and disadvantages, but uh, we, um, I don't know why it moves. Sorry. Uh, maybe I uh, get out from the big screen, if you don't mind. Can you see it that way? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, we decided to organize online uh, meetings and we realized that it's very easy to get in contact with, uh, with um, the speakers, um, with, uh, mm, with the participants, because uh, we do not have to take care about the traveling, about the um, accommodation and other um, time limits. We can uh, easily get in contact them, we can invite them and we can uh, make our events available for a much wider audience. So um, in uh, last summer, we organized a meeting uh, where we also uh, involved uh, the, an interpreter. So we could also solve the language um, barriers and we, can, um, we could open the event for, um, for our international partners. But we still had the problem because of the time zones, because uh, there's a no time which is suitable for every partner. And uh, actually, this was the point where we got the idea to organize an, um, a wider event, a 24 hour long event, where um, everybody can join when they have time and they can um, uh, present themselves and uh, we can discuss uh, topics with uh, common interests. So um, the basic uh, goal of the marathon was to organize a flexible and informal meeting for Living Lakes partners, really just to meet again uh, in a situation when personal meetings is not possible, to uh, get in contact and uh, revive our relationship. So we tried to uh, organize a kind of a party for everyone uh, where the partners can uh, introduce themselves, they can uh, make presentations on their lakes to show the nature, the cultural background, also some kind of um, social aspect. So really to show how diverse the Living Lakes partners, how diverse the lakes in the world. Of course, we were also interested to hear about the problems that uh, the partners' lakes are facing. And uh, we, also, we were also interested to uh, hear about the work they are, um, on, they are working on. Um, so we decided to um, organize uh, the marathon. And um, overall, um, we think it was a very successful uh, event, a very uh, good event. And uh, based on your feedbacks, we also find uh, that uh, uh, the participants uh, find it very useful. Uh, we were very happy that many Living Lakes partners expressed their interest to participate, to introduce uh, their lakes but um, we still uh, had empty, empty places to fill out this 24 hour uh, program. So uh, it provided opportunity to us to uh, look for um, additional lakes to uh, get in contact, new partners, new lakes. And um, 
Uh, finally, we could uh, elaborate a very diverse program and uh, very diverse uh, presentations could be uh, showed for the participants. Um, I think we have very interesting discussions and because um, we didn't uh, give strict guidelines on the presentations and on the topics, um, the topics of the presentations were very widespread. So there were interesting um, um, description of the lakes while other uh, presentations were more scientific. But uh, I think that was one of the most uh, um, uh, important advantage of this lake marathon, this, uh, this uh, diversity and variety of, uh, of, the, of the lakes. And um, it also helped us to find out uh, topics uh, which we think uh, we should uh, further um, work on it. So uh, there were, for example, the topic of the, um, the problem of the microplastics, uh, which, uh, in which I think uh, we can uh, work together because this is a problem which affects many lakes in the world. But um, there are also other topics um, where we think we can organize further workshops and further uh, events in the future. So all in all, I think um, we could meet the original goal that we wanted. So to come together and talk to each other and discuss topics uh, which are um, people, which are the partner lakes are dealing now. Um, of course, we faced some challenges as well during the implementation of the uh, marathon. Um, I do not want to talk about these in details because um, last week we have a separate uh, online meeting uh, where we introduced um, our experiences and uh, uh, the main um, lessons learned from the marathon uh, to you. So now I just want to uh, shortly summarize uh, some of the aspects from which we can learn. Uh, and uh, based on this, we can improve uh, to do it better in the next time. So for us, the main um, uh, challenge was to um, mobilize uh, the uh, partners and to find the uh, proper speakers uh, for the marathon because uh, 24 hours is quite long to uh, fill, uh, fill out with, uh, with speakers and with uh, content. So when we uh, elaborated the program, first we um, tried to compare, to put together the time and the time, the areas from the different time zones. The um, basic aim was that each speaker make their presentation in daytime. So uh, therefore we, uh, put the agenda and we see that, for example, at uh, midnight and one o'clock, which in which time zone this uh, uh, time is in the daytime in the morning. And then from the proper time zone, we started to look for partners. But the problem that um, we didn't receive enough uh, applications from the partners and we didn't have um, proper knowledge from, uh, I don't know, from Russia, from from, um, I don't know, from Africa to look for partners. So it took a long time to, to finalize the program and therefore we have uh, less time for the dissemination and for the dissemination activities. And um, therefore, um, I think this is an activity in which we can improve in the future. Uh, concerning the implementation, um, one, um, a big question was whether we should uh, make registration obligatory for the participants or not, because if there is no registration, uh, participants can freely join uh, to the meeting, but uh, because uh, they do not have to give their um, email address, the name of their um, organization they represent, unfortunately, we do not have detailed information on the participants. So um, uh, after the meeting, we downloaded the statistics from Zoom and it was good to see that um, uh, there were a lot of uh, attempts to join to the meeting. Of course, the list contains uh, both um, uh, 
participants who joined to the meeting only for a minute and then they um, the connection was off and then they rejoined so uh, from this uh, whole list we tried to, uh, we tried to uh, take into account only those participants who stayed with us for um, at least for one presentation, so at least for 30 minutes. And um, uh, according to this, we have uh, more than 120 participants, which is really good. But unfortunately, we do not have uh, other uh, main information on these participants. Um, the other thing is also connected to this uh, one minute uh, connections because uh, we do not know what is the reason of these uh, short connections, because um, it can be maybe the, the system of Zoom. So maybe the Zoom um, put uh, these participants off from the meeting, but maybe uh, the participants had uh, some technical problems. So it uh, also can be an interesting question to uh, discuss it for the future in order to avoid this problem. If I can no. remind it to keep oh, okay. to the time. Okay. So um, the main um, uh, problem was, of course, the personal capacity that um, organizing uh, uh, such a big uh, event is quite long and our agency is too small for it. And um, therefore, um, we have a um, uh, task that we should improve in the future. But because my time is going on, I would like to go on the next slide, so to the conclusion and suggestions, that it was proven that um, partners need these kind of uh, events, so there is, um, they are interested uh, to talk uh, in certain topics in more details, and it was proven that uh, actually technically it's feasible to organize even a 24-hour long event, but of course shorter online events as well. But uh, we think uh, in the future, the, TV, the tasks and the responsibilities should be better divided. Uh, so it would be great to involve Living Lakes partners more in the implementation and in, in the preparation of events. And um, actually, as I mentioned, interpretation is possible. So partners can uh, disseminate this event in their own country as well, if they find an interpreter for it. And um, therefore, we would like to get uh, more information from partners to in which topics they are interested in it. Uh, last week, as I mentioned, we had a discussion with uh, some of you that uh, how we can continue Lake Marathon in this year. And one idea, of course, is to organize a similar 24-hour uh, long event this year. But uh, as I mentioned, we think it might be interesting to organize uh, shorter, so uh, two or three hour thematic workshops in the future where we uh, concentrate on scientific topics, uh, which is in common interest of the partners, and also to strengthen cooperation between uh, regional institutions, for example, schools, <coughs> the partner countries. And um, therefore, uh, the next steps that we would like to focus on now is first of all to uh, make an online survey with the help of the GNF to find out in which topics the partners are interested, uh, in which topics we should organize uh, uh, thematic workshops and uh, also other, uh, other online events. And um, as we said, uh, making um, uh, available, making open our events is not uh, so difficult. So even if a um, Living Lakes partner organizing an online event in their own country, if they share the link of this uh, meeting, other Living Lakes partners can freely join to this meeting. Maybe if they are interested in the topic, they can join if the time is good for them. So we think it might be a good idea to, work, to prepare an online calendar for Living Lakes partners where they can share the link of their own meeting and other Living Lakes partners can look for this calendar and if they're interested, they can, they can attend these conversations. So, Thank you for the opportunity to uh, make this presentation and sorry for being late. And um, of course, we are interested in your opinion and in your questions. So 
if you have any ideas uh, you would like to share, we are uh, happy to hear them even um, in this meeting or if you want, you can contact us after the meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, I can only repeat what Eva said. If you have any questions, ideas, proposals, feel free to send them to us via email. You will see an email on the screen later. After this event, and uh, we will be happy to get back to you or to pick up your ideas so you can take reference to any of the presentations of today. So excellent idea. Um, we will be able together, I guess, to promote this marathon in 2021 even more than you did as Lake Balaton Development Coordination Agency last year. So thank you for this idea and uh, your organization is doing much more. I remember that you have a, an excellent water monitoring program doing a lot of scientific work as well. But I think this was a very good communication approach that we uh, follow in 2021 together. So with that, I hand over to Roman Guzak from Poland and to Katja Weikman from Global Nature Fund working together on a project called Lakes Without Limits or Nature Without Barriers. Uh, focusing on impaired people uh, and also working across borders. So we're curious to hear more, hear more about your activity. Thank you. Roman, you want to go first or Katja? Yeah. Katja, you're muted. Yeah, Katja. now, yeah, now it's good. Now, now you can. Yes, uh, thank you, Uda. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, good morning. <laughs> uh, my name is Katja Weikman. Uh, I'm a project manager, uh, manager by Global Nature Fund. And um, together with um, five further organizations in Europe, we work on a very uh, nice uh, project, a very um, yeah, a reasonable project. Uh, in our times, it, uh, the name is Nature Without Barriers. I would uh, like, uh, I would start the presentation and then hand over to Roman Gujak from the Polish organization Etna. Our project um, is one of the examples of Living Lakes uh, multi-partner projects in Europe. We have chosen this project for presentation in this frame because uh, its objective addresses the issue of water for all in a very special way, as Udo mentioned. Um, the project is intended to help environmental educators to identify opportunities for more accessibility and inclusion in their offers. The guidelines we develop give concrete ideas and support uh, the offer design for both guided and unguided nature experience for people with disabilities. Uh, the original title of the project was Lakes Without Limits, as our original goal was to help to make several European living lakes regions as barrier-free as possible. But after some work uh, working time, we noticed that the concept is, is interesting for much more areas than only lakes. So we have expanded research field to reach more partners and uh, also target groups. Thus, we came also to the name Nature Without Barriers. This project unites partner organizations and experiences from Poland, Hungary, Austria, and Germany. And all the information is available in four European languages, or well, four languages, not only European, English, Polish, Hungarian, and German. Our main idea is not just making special offers for disabled people, but preparing the trails in a way that every person, every visitor can use those better. It is not so much about disability, but uh, about inclusion. Um, now you can see the uh, main page of our project web page. Here we present uh, four main parts. The first one about guided nature experience, the second one, unguided nature experience, and then two parts on concrete steps for eliminating physical and communication barriers when developing um, nature experience offers. Uh, we are still in work and developing more guidelines, but the first one is ready and the second one is um, 
uh, nearly ready and Roman will dwell upon uh, this part of uh, our project. If you are interested in more information, you can um, sign for the newsletter and just um, feel free to visit the web page to uh, get some ideas how a barrier free web page on nature experience could function. Um, now, uh, Roman, I would um, hang over uh, to you. And Roman would give an overview of the main project points and concentrate on uh, some aspects of unguided nature experience. Hi. Uh, have you got uh, the screen with Brett's presentation? Yeah. Do you see it? Or? Yes, we can see Okay. Okay, so uh, like, uh, one can ask uh, where the uh, people with disabilities could go to see nature. And the answer is everywhere, uh, but uh, with proper assistance, proper equipment, but not, uh, not by themselves. Uh, and uh, sometimes you just want to uh, be being uh, less able you want to uh, enjoy uh, nature by yourself. So we uh, provided some, or we are, we are providing, we still work on it, uh, some uh, uh, guide, guidelines uh, on how to prepare the, uh, the paths, uh, nature paths for uh, everyone. Uh, this is, uh, this page here is a sort of special sort of uh, presentation where you can just uh, clicking on this uh, uh, this uh, circles, then you can get information about different different aspects of this uh, project. It's general intro to this topic, so uh, we you find more information later on when you move further into the into our website but it says why we, uh, what is this project about, uh, uh, which sort of education material we have prepared and uh, what, what does it mean to go out by yourself for people who have some restrictions in their lives. Uh, we talk uh, to, the, uh, to the nature educators so, uh, so that they, they have better uh, understanding better experience and how to how to do this uh, this sort of work uh, so uh, one one way is that uh, the in existing nature interpretation parts they are not always ready to, to for the visitors who have problems uh, we ourselves have been participating um, in some experience here, you see Katya on the wheelchair and, um, and me with the blind uh, uh, over my, well, now not over my eyes, but, but pretending to be blind and, and trying to feel by ourselves, what does it mean to, uh, to have some uh, problems with uh, um, with full perception, with full mobility. Uh, of course, it, it, we encourage the, uh, the educators to contact the people with disabilities so they get uh, more real insight uh, into what can be done, how can we improve our offer. Uh, it's very important that uh, all parts of our offer are prepared, uh, starting with the information that the websites are barrier free. There are special ways to prepare the website so that everyone can use it, even uh, blind persons with the screen readers, etc. Mm -hmm. Then on the location that the information is available uh, in different forms, uh, like the uh, braille uh, script uh, here, or, or that uh, anything is Ever uh, accessible uh, that the, the uh, plate, information plate, or or the some objects that you can touch, they are not 
away from the path, so so people on the wheelchair can can approach them, etc. This uh, this seems very simple, but it's sort of a knowledge uh, to share with uh, with the educators because not always you realize that uh, that you did something wrong uh, wrong way and that it makes it impossible to to enjoy to fully enjoy the, the path. Mm. Then um, it's important that uh, uh, the things are safe and uh, so uh, and easy to use. So, for instance, the, uh, um, there there should be some uh, handrails or or carps on the on the path, so people can feel. People who don't see, they can feel the the way, and people on the wheelchairs, they don't. Fall accidentally out of the path into, into some dangerous situation. Uh, so, um, so there. Is, this is sort of uh, of um, of a wisdom that we try to find, to share with between each other, and and to uh, put uh, to transfer further to for the use. Uh, we should remember that the weather and different uh, other obstacles may happen, and that uh, that you should also be prepared for for that sort of, of situations, like uh, different hazards, uh, like uh, some something lying on the path or branches that hang uh, too low that uh, that someone can not see them and uh, have problems uh, walking. Uh, as I mentioned, we try to to make it uh, simple, so uh, and uh, complete uh, that we we try to uh, to try to work on the whole service chain and to to include all the aspects from information and uh, approach to the to the to the place, but also to by improving infrastructure and. and uh, uh, adjust the educational offers to any uh, any target group and we have like four target groups uh, it is a people with mobility restrictions uh, symbolized here by the wheelchair uh, with hearing problems with uh, seeing problems uh, yeah here people who could understand the sign language or or yeah, again mobility uh, and uh, people, we, we also have special focus on people who help uh, so-called learning problems or less able to understand. So we use the simple language uh, as much as possible. And uh, as Katya mentioned, uh, the, the main idea is to that uh, this is not a special offer for the, uh, for the people with disabilities, because we all become more or less disabled, our our hearing or, and seeing is is uh, uh, less uh, less good in, uh, with the age. Uh, so um, so it uh, it helps everyone uh, to uh, better understand, better utilize, better better enjoy the uh, nature, um, and. Um, mm, uh, moreover, uh, in case of people with learning difficulties, there are also uh, a lot of uh, foreigners who, for whom easy language is, is more understandable. So it's not only uh, in, in uh, it's not only the people with disabilities uh, who benefit from it, but everyone can benefit. Uh, so. Um, Roman, we're running out of time. Yep. Uh, okay. So we prepared a special matrix to uh, evaluate the uh, nature paths. Uh, that's a, a special tool uh, who, that helps to design and improve existing paths step by step. Not necessarily everything in one time, but uh, but just uh, uh, slowly to, uh, to make it better. So thank you, and we hope you you'll join. Uh, this uh, this thing this sort of thinking I, it helped me very much to be in this project thanks thank you very much katya and roman for this introduction to a very inclusive and creative new project i have attended once a museum 
in Frankfurt, a dark museum that gives you the impression of being blind. It's quite an interesting experience. And many cities have that. So I encourage you to do that if you have this opportunity. You will find the links to many of the projects and to many things that have been said and shared in the chat here. But as I said later, we will put uh, the email address on display and you can send us messages. And that's the intention of this meeting today before we go to the last presentation uh, that we want to share ideas, that we want to create networks and a little bit like Mother Teresa once said, we want to throw little stones. We know that we cannot change the world alone, but if we throw little stones, they create ripples and then this will ultimately lead to some waves that help to change the world. So you don't have to be a Christian to share that thought. Okay, then as a last short presentation from Michael Bender, an overview on ongoing or forthcoming activities. Um, Michael, you're ready? Yes, thank you so much. Um, we have, I think, 59 participants today. So I think it's a good, good success. And uh, can you can you see the screen? Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so the title today is Threatened Lake Areas. And I want to use the opportunity to give a message from our network. And, and there's a petition going on about the uh, Odra River, about Odra River Delta protection. And it starts just now. And um, this is about uh, protection of, of Odra River and Odra River Delta against uh, big navigation and uh, flood protection projects. There is a very old plan to connect uh, Odra River with uh, Elbe River and the Nube River throughout the countryside with uh, a little, um, little good, good uh, effects on, on transportation, but uh, devastating effects on nature. And there's a petition going on and I shared uh, all the videos and all the uh, possibilities to access this um, petition and to support this uh, in the chat. And if you scroll up the chat a little bit, then you will uh, find it. Um, today we have this uh, World Wetlands Day uh, that we celebrate. And initially we also wanted to have a second part today, which is a wetlands and climate change, but we will put this to the World Water Day on 22nd of March. And uh, that we will learn a little bit more about uh, climate change research and um, the, the effect also of the drought years of the last three, four uh, very dry years on, on wetlands and how we maybe have to adapt our management procedures of, of and lakes. But um, as Odo already mentioned in, in his introduction, uh, it's not only um, Global Nature Fund Living Lakes um, who is organizing this event, it's also the German Forum on Environment and Development, which is an umbrella organization of German environment and, and development aid uh, NGOs. And uh, we together organize a whole series of, of events that will lead from World Wetlands Day uh, through the Day of International River Action to the uh, World Water Day. And you can see uh, all the organizations that are participating in the organization uh, down on this, um, on this slide I show you. And it's about water in the city, water in the country, and uh, water protection, water for all. The thing starts on, um, on an event on the 24th of February, with, um, which will deal with over-abstraction pollution in, of agriculture hunger, poverty, 
and will promote uh, agroecology as a means of uh, dealing well with the water resources as well as with uh, biodiversity possibilities, also to uh, better allow for the human right to water and access to water. This event is mainly organized by uh, German organization Weltfriedensdienst, which is World Peace Service something, uh, Bread for the World, which is our main um, evangelic help uh, organization, and FIAN, which is another um, development aid organization in Germany. And we will have guests from uh, Brazil and Senegal, and also the Ministry for Economic Cooperation will be there. The second one is about water in cities, and it's uh, the access to drinking water, the right, human right to water, but also about the um, effects of climate change on, on our water uh, resources and how can we deal with this situation in the cities. And we will have the Indian uh, winner of the Stockholm Water Prize here, and also uh, a person from the Emscher Genossenschaft, which is a publicly owned um, water providing company. And uh, the Emscher Genossenschaft is, I think it's the biggest uh, river restoration and wetland restoration project in Europe that they are doing with uh, their water body. And it's also about the blue community. Blue community is a possibility of communities to adapt uh, or to commit themselves to a variety of rules that uh, would allow better to, to have the right to water and uh, good transparency implemented. We have this in Berlin, but it's also a model in Paris and in other cities. The next one is about hydropower. It's about protection of rivers. And hydropower might be seen by some people as a good way to combat climate change, but uh, we also have to say that it has really devastating uh, effect on river ecology, of river continuity, the migrating fish uh, cannot um, access the, uh, the spawning grounds. And we also have, uh, in the end, a threat to the deltas when the sediments are held back in the in the dams, then uh, we have a big uh, problem as uh, the deltas are disappearing in the ocean, more or less, because no sediments are, are coming any longer. And we will have discussion here uh, with guests from Brazil and also uh, we have uh, from Albania, where we have uh, the natural rivers, the nearly pristine rivers that we want to protect from hydropower, but we also uh, would of course discuss uh, the situation in Germany. So, and to summon all these things up, we have on the 18th, 18th of March, um, a more policy discussion, uh, with also the Ministry of uh, Environment, Ministry of um, Economic Cooperation, but also um, international guests like Lesha Wittmer from the European Pact of Water and uh, Women for Water Partnership, Danish Zune, coordinator of the uh, Eco, oh, what is it? Eco, ecumenisch, ecumenical uh, water network of the world churches. Maud Barlow, uh, alternative Nobel Prize uh, winner, Council of Canadians will be there. And also from the German parliament. So we have a kind of, yeah, a round table panel discussion on, on water policy, the role of Germany in the world, but also the, the water policy in, in Germany and neighboring countries and Europe, of course. So I think that's that's my little contribution of how this series of, of water events um, will continue. And I hope um, to see a lot of you uh, again in the following sessions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Michael. We're at the end uh, of our time frame, so we have to speed up a little bit. Uh, I would like to thank all presenters, all six presenters, Antonio, Bettina, Eva, Katja, Roman, and Michael for their presentations. A perfect gender balance, three women, three men, very good. And of course, I would like to thank our co-hosts, the, the Green League, as well as the Forum Environment and Development, and particularly Ramona, for assisting us in the organization of this event, Bekan, thank you very much. And thirdly, I would like to thank you, the participants, for staying with us. At the next event, uh, we plan to split into breakout rooms in order to allow discussion. Uh, such tools are not appropriate for a discussion in a larger group. Uh, so we have a couple of projects where we would be very happy to meet you again. For instance, there is a research uh, program or project that we started with support from the German ministry, uh, the Federal Ministry for the Environment on climate change impacts on lakes. And their dialogue and discussion is very crucial. So we want to exchange experiences like we always do in many of the projects. So with that, I would like to share my screen in order to show you the email address where you can send your comments, your proposals, your questions to, and then we will reply to you or get back to you. And as a last sentence, I would like to thank you very much for being here. And I would like to uh, wish you all the best for the future. Stay healthy. And I hope to meet you again soon, virtually or even better in person. Thank you very much and bye bye. We will stay here for one or two more minutes that you can see this email address. Thank you, take good care. Thank you. Thank you, you do. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. See you soon. Bye bye. bye, -bye.